Hi, my name is John Nettleton. I'm the Chief Systems Architect for Solid Run. And today, this is the kick off of a new series we're really starting. Uh, I'm calling it Solid Run Dev Cuts to start with. And uh, really, what we're going to try to do is do bi weekly um, cuts of little how to's, um, talk about specific things that we're working with from a developer perspective. Uh, this isn't really like a product showcase, um, but more about what we're doing with the products, um, features we've added, uh, maybe cool things you could do with it, like maybe we'll do some machine learning stuff, um, and also cover some things where we get a lot of questions about it, but we need to add more um, in-depth stuff where just having a video makes uh, a little more educational and a little more fun. So this one I'm going to focus off on is our uh, System Ready ES certified honeycomb system. And we get a lot of questions about how is it as a desktop? How does it work? Uh, what do I need to get it running? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a Fedora 35 install and uh, talk about some of the quirks and workarounds that are still needed, unfortunately, um, but are there. And then just a basic setup. I'll probably break this into two quick videos. The first one where I'll do the install, uh, talk about the bootloader, and then the second one uh, I'll break off into the specific quirks and the features uh, and, and what it fixes and why they're needed. Um, so that can be looked at separate. And, and so without further ado, let me uh, kick off my system ready ES machine, my honeycomb, and we will uh, get to the install. So this system, uh, my honeycomb, is uh, already has the EFI bootloader installed on it. Uh, you can get those at images.solid-run.com. Uh, here you'll see it's booting up, a very standard EFI install. Uh, I hit escape to set it up. Uh, this specific machine has a uh, 32 gigs of memory in it, uh, and it's uh, got an NVMe drive as well as a SATA drive. Uh, I use this for lots of development so uh, there is an existing installation that will uh, just install over. This also has an AMD uh, Radeon RX 550 in it. Um, we recommend the Polaris cards just because AMD has uh, an AR64 GOP driver which is why I can use uh, EFI uh, through HDMI. Um, because of that, uh, one of the things I want to do is I'll go in here and check my console preference selection. It's already set to graphical. Um, you can also choose serial and do serial install if this is a server and you're not going to have a GPU. Um, that This would be very similar, except it would be over a serial console. Um, now, I already have a USB thumb drive installed that has Fedora 35 workstation live uh, install. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go down. These are all our my boot devices. I'm going to select the SanDisk Ultra that it's installed on and click Enter. Um, now immediately we're going to get the Grub menu and we need to edit the entry to boot this and install it. The reason um, there's so there's two reasons I'm using Fedora 35. The first is uh, it's a it's the distro I use on my own desktop. Um, but it's also a very um, bleeding edge kernel. Um, to get the full networking support which you need, you need a mainline kernel that's 5.14 or, or newer. Um, that's when the ACPI support for the MDIO uh, set up for the FIs that are needed for our onboard NIC. Um, since Fedora 35 has that, I'm familiar with it, I'm going to do the install here. However, any uh, more recent distribution should have that has a 5.14 kernel or newer should be able to install in the same generic way as you would an x86 machine um, with a couple of caveats. The first one is we are still missing um, uh, SMMU support for um, the networking complex. Um, we're PCIe, this is set up automatically. Um, we need uh, sp a specific table that's set up for the networking complex uh, called IORT RMRs. 
reserved memory regions. And while there is an ARM spec for it and it's included in our firmware, and we have patches in our custom kernel, uh, those patches weren't accepted by the ARM maintainers in mainline Linux, and so this is all being reworked. Until that is sorted out, um, we need to add, uh, we need to bypass the SMMU. So we add arm SMMU dot disable bypass equals zero and IMU dot pass through equals one. Additionally, um, there is an issue with um, the AMD GPU driver on our platform running under Xorg. Um, this can be worked around, and I'll show you those workarounds in the second video when I show you the quirks and workarounds. Um, but for this one, what I will do is um, I will just uh, blacklist that module. And what that does is instead of using the AMD GPU driver in the kernel, the kernel, you, the in installer will use software rendering. Uh, leveraging the EFI GOP driver that uh, has already been initialized by the EFI firmware. And then we'll hit Control X to boot. And if I typed all that correctly, hopefully, because this is not a um, my standard keyboard, uh, we should be able to boot up. Um, and so one of the things that I'm covering this is uh, People think, oh, it's system ready. Uh, the system's system ready. Everything's just going to work perfect. And while it covers a lot of the standards for booting, there are still a lot of things that haven't been fully covered in the ARM64 ecosystem regarding mainline Linux, the GUI desktops, and those sorts of things. And while um, we've uh, worked very hard to get as much um, to fix bugs and find bugs and find workarounds or solutions, it's not necessarily 100% at this point. Uh, it's There's a lot of um, work we're doing trying to go between uh, getting mainline support in the different projects. And I just closed my installer. So what we'll do is, um, yeah, so uh, we're trying to get support into mainline for all the projects where we found some issues, uh, Mesa, XORG, the mainline kernel, um, but it's it's slow moving just because most developers don't have ARM64 workstations to work on. Uh, so anyways, we'll start the installer now. We'll do a quick install. While that's installing, I'll talk about a few other things. And then uh, we will, um, I'll finish up the first boot and then uh, we'll start the second video and I'll talk about the, the quirks and workarounds that we have. Um, so while I am in Denmark, I am an English speaker. Since I'm installing on an existing setup, doing a clean install, I'm just going to um, custom set up my partition table. Uh, if you're doing a clean install, then you can just accept the defaults if that's what you want or um, do it however you like. I mean, this is very much the same thing as uh, setting up a normal desktop. Really, the, the one of the things you'll find is there just aren't any differences um, once you have the quirks and errata kind of worked around. Um, so now we just need to do a clean install here. And this series in general, uh, we're not going to find that they're going to be super long. I'm just doing this um, because it, it's something that uh, as more and more developers find interest in and with more and more um, capable machines coming to the market that are ARM64, they, they have questions about well, what can and can I do on my desktop? Um, should I get it? Can I do what I want on it? Um, I, th I think Honeycomb is uh, an interesting 
kind of step for developers because not only right now where you can use it as a desktop and install a, a PCIe card in it and a GPU um, and work on your projects, use it as a desktop. Um, as more powerful chips come out in the future, this is a this is a platform that's really because it's a mini ITX form factor and it has great things like ECC ECC memory and SATA storage and NVMe um, and lots of uh, networking. That's another one I'll probably cover in a later video. Uh, with the 10 gig networking, it can actually move to be a micro server or uh, the centerpiece to if you want to build out a 10 gig network. Um, we have switching available and you know you have four 10 gig ports on the honeycomb all which are um, great as a future proofing for the platform uh, you know uh, I, I guess i haven't mentioned this is a, a 16 core by default at two gigahertz um, uh, and if you aren't really if you want to really push it as a desktop you can build your own firmware and overclock it 2.2 gigahertz it's pretty stable um, no problems. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about uh, is why we're suggest recommending AMD uh, Polaris GPUs. Um, I know they're older and the Navi's out now and unfortunately in mainline kernel um, initial Navi support was for ARM64 was added in uh, 5.10 however the patch was reverted because the Navi code base for the driver uses um, vector instructions and registers and the way that they were implemented for x86 wasn't compatible with ARM64 and it was actually uh, there could be collisions between the register space uh, between user space and the kernel so that was that support was reverted um, hopefully when GPU prices come down they're not insane um, we'll lead an effort to kind of get the Navi support um, working in the mainline kernel. So rewriting some of the, and moving around some of the code and getting it so it can compile and run safely under uh, AR64 as well as x86. For now, um, the Polaris cards, if, if you can get one, the RX5 uh, series, the WX uh, 2100s, 30, 3100s, all those cards, um, really, they're really stable once you get them set up and a few of the quirks worked around. Uh, I actually am using this, I'm doing this OBS recording right now on my Honeycomb workstation. Uh, it's got a USB HDMI capture card, my USB mic. Uh, it's being um, encoded uh, using uh, VA API through OBS. And uh, it's, you can see it's all running great. It's filtering out my green screen uh, so we're all uh, really it's uh, quite a stable desktop like I said it's not blazing fast we're not talking Neo first N1 cores but if you used to use like a core i5 laptop and you move to this you're really not seeing a huge performance difference sure um, some things will be much faster on a on the Core i5 single that are single threaded just because it's got a much higher boost in performance but because the Honeycomb has 16 cores uh, the workload can really be spread out so if you're using Chrome with a lot of tabs you have lots of cores to run those those tabs on um, it has no problem even using software decoding to play back YouTube um, but all the features are there if you do go the way you can get uh, the use the AMD GPU and VA API for hardware graphics acceleration. Um, so, uh, um, and that's about it. Uh, we're installing the bootloader now. Um, not much left in the installation process. Uh, uh, again, if you guys have questions about the video, things you think I should change, add them to the comments below. Uh, if you want to talk to us directly, you can uh, go to the developer ecosystem discord um, or hit us up on Twitter. Uh, I have both linked there. Um, I guess we can add them to the links below as well. And you can come and talk to us uh, if you have questions about the platform or specific queries. Um, the development community is really great. Like I said, 
we have developers who are packaging up uh, our BSP kernel or the, the changes we've added to mainline to make the more, give you more device support. And uh, we have developers who are uh, packaging that for Ubuntu, um, Arch Limit, Linux, um, uh, Nix OS is very popular in our community, Fedora, CentOS Stream, um, any of those, uh, like I said, the generic kernel like I'm using right now will give you support for basically 90% of the hardware, I would say at this point, uh, you know, uh, USB 3, AT, uh, SATA, NVMe, uh, other PCIe support. Um, uh, we have the PWM thermal management that's supported in mainline kernel. Um, and really, it's it's really small pieces that we're just trying to finish up. Okay, our installation is done, so we can finish. And uh, with that done, now we're just going to reboot the computer. Um, so now as the computer reboots, um, uh, we'll just select the disk that we uh, installed onto, and then uh, we'll get up into the first boot. And that's where I'll cut this video off, and then we'll pick it up for the next one. Hope this has been informative to you, and I, I hope you like this format. Um, so here the Fedora install is already there, but um, because that's pointing to an old install, I'm just gonna choose the disk that I put the boot EFI partition on. And then uh, as it boots up, it'll auto configure and boot from that from now on. So this is my, uh, the 970 EVO one terabyte is my NVMe drive that we'll be booting from. Um, Hopefully. Oh. Uh, should be. Okay. Well, let's try Fedora. Oh, yeah, there it is. Oh, okay. I did add the entry. So, again, one. Um, on this boot again, we're going to have to bypass the SMMU. Um, this is just the basic setups. Uh, once we get to this point, um, once we get booted into the installation, I will um, show you how you can make these permanent changes. And um, And then uh, basically they'll be picked up on all kernel updates and, and you really don't have to worry about it again. And uh, now we should be able to boot up into our installation and we'll get to the first boot. This should launch us into Fedora's first time setup. Uh, obviously, if, you're, if your distro's um, installer does something different, um, you might just boot right up into you know, the default desktop or the default user space, um, and that should all work. So here we are. Uh, we should get the installer, the welcome to Fedora. Um, I will uh, cut this video off now, and then I will uh, start the setup on the next video. I hope you enjoyed it. You can leave comments below. Uh, have a good day.